Hello, and welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weyenberg. This time we're going to continue our reading of The Carousoin by George MacDonald. The Carousoin at this point is about Colin, who has lost his baby boy to the fairies, and he's gone to seek help from an old woman. The old woman turned her face toward the fire, for although it was summer, it was cold at night on the moor. Colin, moved by sudden curiosity, instead of walking out of the hut after Jenny, as he ought to have done, crept round by the wall and peeped in the old woman's face. There, instead of wrinkled blindness, he saw a pair of flashing orbs of light, which were rather reflected on the fire than had the fire reflected in them. But the same instant, the hut and all that was in it vanished. He felt the cold fog of the moor blowing upon him, and he fell heavily to the earth. 11. The Goblin Cobbler When he came to himself, he lay upon the moor still. He got up and gazed around. The moon was up, but there was no hut to be seen. He was sorry enough now that he had been so foolish. He called, Jenny, Jenny, but in vain. What was he to do? Tomorrow was the eighth of the nine days left, and if before twelve at night the following day he had not rescued his boy, nothing could be done, at least for seven years more. True, the year was not quite out till about seven the following evening, but the fairies, instead of giving days of grace, always take them. He could do nothing but begin to walk, simply because that gave him a shadow more of a chance of finding the cobbler than if he sat still. But there was no possibility of choosing one direction rather than another. He wandered the rest of that night and the next day. He could not go home before the hour when the cobbler could no longer help him. Such was his anxiety that though he neither ate nor drank, he ne never thought about the cause of his gathering weakness. As it grew dark, however, he became painfully aware of it, and was just on the point of sitting down exhausted upon a great white stone that looked inviting, when he saw a faint glimmering in front of him. He was erect in a moment and making toward the place. As he drew near, he became aware of a noise made up of many smaller noises, such as might have proceeded from some kind of factory. Not till he was close to the place could he see that it was a long, low hut with one door and no windows. The light shone from the door, which stood wide open. He approached and peeped in. There sat a multitude of cobblers, each on his stool, with his candle stuck in the hole in the seat, cobbling away. They looked rather little men, though not at all fairy size. The most remarkable thing about them was that at any given moment they were all doing precisely the same thing, as if they had been a piece of machinery. When one drew the threads in stitching, they all did the same. If Colin saw one wax his thread and looked up, he saw they were all waxing their threads. If one took to hammering on his lapstone, they did not follow his example, but altogether with him, they caught up their lapstones and fell to hammering away, as if nothing, nothing but hammering could ever be demanded of them. And when he came to look at them more closely, he saw that every one was blind of an eye and had a nose turned up like an awl. Every one of them, however, looked different from the rest, notwithstanding the very close resemblance in their features. The moment they caught sight of him, they rose as one man, pointed their awls at him, and advanced toward him like a close bush of aloes glittering with spikes. "'Fine upper leathers,' said one and all, with a variety of accordant grimaces. "'Top of his head, good paste bowl," said the next general remark. "'Coarse hair, good ends,' followed. "'Sinews, good thread.' Bones and pa blood, good paste for seven leaguers. Ears, good loops to pull them on with, pair short now. Soles, same for queen slippers. And so they went on, portioning out his body in the most irreverent fashion for the uses of their trade, till having come to his teeth and said, Teeth, good brads, they all gave a shriek like the whisk of the waxed threads through the leather and sprung upon him with their awls drawn back like daggers. There was not a moment to lose. The old woman with the spindle, said Colin. Don't know her, shrieked the gob cobblers. The old woman with the distaff, said Colin, and they all scurried back to their seats and fell to hammering vigorously. She de desired me, continued Colin, to ask the cobbler for a lump of his wax. Every one of them caught up his lump of wrought resin and held it out to Colin. He took the one offered by the nearest and found that all their lumps were gone, after which they sat motionless and stared at him. 
But what am I to do with it? asked Colin. I will walk a little way with you, said the near one nearest, and tell you all about it. The old woman is my grandmother, and a very worthy old soul she is. Colin stepped out at the door of the workshop, and the cobbler followed him. Looking round, Colin saw all the stools vacant, and the place as still as an old churchyard. The cobbler, who now in his talk, gestures, and general demeanor appeared a very respectable, not to say conventional, little man, proceeded to give him all the information he required, accompanying it with the present of one of his favorite awls. They walked a long way, till Colin was amazed to find that his strength stood out so well. But at length the cobbler said, I see, sir, the sun is at hand. I must return to my vocation. When the sun is once up, you will know where you are. He turned aside a few yards from the path and entered the open door of a cottage. In a moment, the place resounded with the soft hammering of 313 cobblers, each with his candle stuck in a hole in the stool on which he sat. While Colin stood gazing in wonderment, the rim of the sun crept up above the horizon, and there the cottage stood, white and sleeping, while the cobblers, their lights, their stools, and their tools had all vanished. Only there was still the sound of the hammers ringing in his head, where it seemed to shape itself into words something like these. A good deal had to give way to the rhyme, for they were more particular about their rhymes than their etymology. Dub-a-dub, dub-a-dub, cobbler's man, hammer it, stitch it as fast as you can. The weekday ogre is wanting his boots. The trip-a-trap fairy is going barefoots. Dream daughter has worn out her heels and her toeses for want of cork slippers to walk over noses. Spark eye the smith may shoe the nightmare, the kelpie and pookie, the nine-footed bear. We shoe the mermaids, the tips of their tails, stitching the leather onto their scales. We shoe the brownie, clumsy and toeless, and then he goes quiet as a mole or a molus. There is but one creature that we cannot shoe, and that is the boneless, all made of glue. A great deal of nonsense of this sort went through Colin's head before the sounds died away. Then he found himself standing in the field outside his own orchard. 12. The Wax and the Awl The evening arrived. The sun was going down over the sea, cloudless, casting gold from him lavishly, when Colin arrived on the shore at some distance from his home. The tide was falling, and a good space of sand was uncovered, and lay glittering in the setting sun. This sand lay between some rocks and the sea, and from the rocks innumerable runnels of water that had been left behind in their hollows were hurrying back to their mother. These occasionally spread into little shallow lakes resting in hollows in the sand. These lakes were in a constant ripple from the flow of the little streams through them, and the sun shining on these multitudinous ripples, the sand at the bottom shone like brown silk watered with gold only that the golden lines were flitting about like living things, never for a moment in one place. Now, Colin had no need of fairy ointment to anoint his eyes and make him able to see fairies. Most people need this, but Colin was naturally gifted. Therefore, as he drew near a certain high rock which he knew very well, and from which many streams were flowing back into the sea, he saw that the little lakes about it were crowded with fairies, playing all kinds of pranks in the water. It was a lovely sight to see them thus frolicking in the light of the setting sun in their gay dresses, sparkling with jewels, or what looked like jewels, flashing all colors as they moved. But Colin had not much time to see them, for the moment they saw him, knowing that this was the man who they had wronged by stealing his child, and knowing too that he saw them, they fled at once up the high rock and vanished. This was just what Colin wanted. He went all round and round the rock, looked at every direction in which there might be a pool, found more fairies here and there who fled like the first up the rock and disappeared. When he had thus driven them all from the sands, he approached the rock, taking the lump of cobbler's wax from his pocket as he went. He scrambled up the rock and, without showing his face, put his hand on the uppermost edge of it and began drawing a line with the wax all along it. He went creeping round the rock, till still drawing the wax along the edge, till he had completed the circuit. Then he peeped over. Now in the heart of this rock, which was nearly covered at high water, there was a big basin, known as the Kelpie's Pool, filled with seawater and the loveliest seaweed and many little sea animals, and this was a favorite resort of the fairies. It was now, of course, crowded. 
When they saw his big head come peeping over, they burst into a loud fit of laughter and began mocking him and making game of him in a hundred ways. Some made the ugliest faces they could, some queer gestures of contempt, others sung bits of songs and so on, while the queen sat by herself on a projecting corner of the rock with her feet in the water and looked at him sulkily. Many of them kept on plunging and swimming and diving and floating while they mocked him, and Colin would have enjoyed the sight much if they had not spoiled their beauty and their motions by their grimaces and their gestures. "'I want my child,' said Colin. "'Give him his child!' cried one. Thereupon a dozen of them dived and brought up a huge sea slug, a horrid creature like a lump of blubber, and held it up to him, saying, "'There he is! Come down and fetch him!' Others offered him a blue lobster struggling in their grasp, others a spider crab, others a whelk, while some of them gave, some of them sung mocking verses, each capping the line the other gave. At length they lifted a dreadful object from the bottom. It was like a baby with half his face eaten away by the fishes, only that he had a huge nose like the big toe of a lobster. But Colin was not to be taken in. Very well, good people, he said, I will try something else. He crept down the rock again, took out the little cobbler's awl, and began boring a hole. It went through the rock as if it had been butter, and as he drew it out the water followed in a far-reaching spout. He bored another and another, and went on boring till there were three hundred and thirteen spouts gushing from the rock, and running away in a strong little stream toward the sea. He sat then on the ed ledge at the foot of the rock and waited. By and by he heard a clamor of little voices from the basin. They had found the water was getting very low. But when they discovered the holes by which it was escaping, "'He's got Dottle Cobb's all! He's got Dottle Cobb's all!' they cried with one voice of horror. When he heard this, Colin climbed the rock again to enjoy their confusion. But here I must explain a little. In the former part of this history, I showed how fond these fairies were of water. But the fact was, they were far too fond of it. It had grown a thorough dissipation with them. Their business had been chiefly to tend and help the flowers in which they lived, and to do good offices for everything that had any kind of life about them, hence their name of good people. But from finding the good the water did to the flowers, and from sharing in the refreshment it brought them, flowing up to them in tiny runnels through the veins of the plants, they had fallen in love with the water itself for its own sake, or rather for the pleasure it gave them, irrespective of the good it was to the flowers which lived upon it. So they neglected their business, and took to sailing on the streams and plunging into every pool they could find, hence the rapidity of their decline and fall. Again, on coming to the sea coast, they had found that the salt water did much to restore the beauty they had lost by partaking of the kerosene. Therefore, they were constantly on the shore, bathing forever in the water, especially that left in this pool by the ebbing tide, which was particularly to their taste. Till at last they had grown entirely dependent for comfort on the sea water, and, they thought, entirely dependent on it for existence also, at least such existence as was in the least worth possessing. Therefore, when they saw the big face of Colin peering once more over the ledge, they rushed at him in a rage, scrambling up the side of the rock like so many mad beetles. Colin drew back and let them come on. The moment the foremost put his foot on the line that Colin had drawn round the rock, he slipped and tumbled backwards head over heels into the pool, shrieking, He's got Dottle Cobb's wax! He's got Dottle Cobb's wax! screamed the next as he fell backward after his companion and this took place till no one would approach the line. In fact, no fairy could keep his footing on the wax, and the line was so broad, for as Colin rubbed it, it had melted and spread, that not one of them could spring over it. The queen now rose. "'What do you want, Colin?' she said. "'I want my child, as you know very well,' answered Colin. "'Come and take him,' returned the queen, and sat down again, not now with her feet in the water, for it was much too low for that." but Colin knew better. He sat down on the edge of the basin. Unfortunately, the tail of his coat crossed the line. In a moment, half a dozen of the fairies were out of the circle. Colin rose instantly, and there was not much harm done, for the multitude was still in prison. The water was nearly gone, beginning to leave the very roots of the long tangles uncovered. At length, the queen could bear it no longer. "'Look here, Colin,' she said, "'I wish you well.' 
As she spoke, she rose and descended the side of the rock toward the water now far below her. She had to be very cautious, too. The stones were so slippery, though there was none of Dottle Cobb's wax there. About halfway below where the surface of the pool had been, she stopped and pushed a stone aside. Colin saw what seemed the entrance to a cave inside the rock. The queen went in. A few moments after she came out, wringing her hands, Oh dear, oh dear, what shall I do, she cried. You horrid thick people will grow so. He's grown to such a size I can't get him out. Will you let him go if I get him out, asked Colin. I will, I will. We shall all be starved to death for want of seawater if I don't, she answered. Swear by the cobbler's awl and the cobbler's wax, said Colin. I swear, said the queen. By the cobbler's awl and the cobbler's wax, insisted Colin. I swear by the cobbler's all and the cobbler's wax, returned the queen. In the name of your people? In the name of my people, said the queen, that none of us here present will ever annoy you or your family hereafter. Then I'll come down, said Colin, and jumped into the basin. With the cobbler's all, he soon cleared a big opening into the rock, for it bored and cut it like butter. Then out crept a beautiful boy of about ten years old into his father's arms, with his eyes and ears and chin and cheek all safe and sound, and he carried him home to his mother. It was a disappointment to find him so much of a baby at his age, but that fault soon began to mend, and the house was full of jubilation. And little Colin told them the whole story of his sojourn among the fairies, and it did not take so long as you would think, for he fancied he had been there only about a week. And now on to our next tale, The Golden Key. There was a boy who used to sit in the twilight and listen to his great aunt's stories. She told him that if he could find the place where the end of the rainbow stands, he would find there a golden key. And what is the key for? the boy would ask. What is it the key of? What will it open? That nobody knows, his aunt would reply. He has to find that out. I suppose, being gold, the boy once said thoughtfully, that I could get a deal of money for it if I sold it. Better never find it than sell it, returned his aunt. Then the boy went to bed and dreamed about the golden key. <clears throat> now all that his great aunt told the boy about the golden key would have been nonsense had it not been that their little house stood on the borders of fairyland. For it is perfectly well known that out of fairyland nobody can ever find where the rainbow stands. The creature takes such good care of its golden key it's always flitting from place to place, lest anyone should find it. But in fairyland it is quite different. Things that look real in this country look very thin indeed in fairyland, while some of the things that here cannot stand still for a moment will not move there. So it was not in the least absurd of the old lady to tell her nephew such things about the golden key. Did you ever know anybody find it? he asked one evening. Yes, your father, I believe, found it. And what did he do with it, can you tell me? He never told me. What was it like? He never showed it to me. How does a new key come there always? I don't know. There it is. Perhaps it is the rainbow's egg. Perhaps it is. You'll be a happy boy if you find the nest. Perhaps it comes tumbling down the rainbow from the sky. Perhaps it does. One evening in summer, he went into his own room and stood at the lattice window and gazed into the forest which fringed the outskirts of fairyland. It came close up to his great aunt's garden and indeed sent some straggling trees into it. The forest lay to the east, and the sun, which was setting behind the cottage, looked straight into the dark wood with his level red eye. The trees were all old and had few branches below, so that the sun could see a great way into the forest, and the boy, being keen-sighted, could see almost as far as the sun. The trunks stood like rows of red columns in the shine of the red sun, and he could see down aisle after aisle in the vanishing distance. And as he gazed into the forest, he began to feel as if the trees were all waiting for him, and had something they could not go on with till he came to them. But he was hungry and wanted his supper, so he lingered. Suddenly, far among the trees, as far as the sun could shine, 
he saw a glorious thing. It was the end of a rainbow, large and brilliant. He could count all seven colors and could see shade after shade beyond the violet, while before the red stood a color more gorgeous and mysterious still. It was a color he had never seen before. Only the spring of the rainbow arch was visible. He could see nothing of it above the trees. The golden key, he said to himself, and darted out of the house and into the wood. He had not gone far before the sun set, but the rainbow only glowed the brighter, for the rainbow of fairyland is not dependent upon the sun as ours is. The trees welcomed him, the bushes made way for him, the rainbow grew larger and brighter, and at length he found himself within two trees of it. It was a grand sight burning away there in silence, with its gorgeous, lovely, delicate colors, each distinct, all combining. He could now see a great deal more of it. It rose high into the blue heavens, but bent so little that he could not tell how high the crown of the arch must reach. It was still only a small portion of a huge bow. He stood gazing at it till he forgot himself with delight, even forgot the key which he had come to seek. And as he stood, it grew more wonderful still, for in each of the colors, which was as large as the column of a church, he could faintly see beautiful forms slowly ascending as if by the steps of a winding stair. The forms appeared irregularly, now one, now many, now several, now none, men and women and children, all different, all beautiful. He drew nearer to the rainbow. It vanished. He started back a step in dismay. It was there again, as beautiful as ever. So he contented himself with standing as near it as he might and watching the forms that ascended the glorious colors toward the unknown height of the arch, which did not end abruptly, but faded away in the blue air so gradually that he could not say where it ceased. When the thought of the golden key returned, the boy very wisely proceeded to mark out in his mind the space covered by the foundation of the rainbow, in order that he might know where to search should the rainbow disappear. It was based chiefly upon a bed of moss. Meantime, it had grown quite dark in the wood. The rainbow alone was visible by its own light. But the moment the moon rose, the rainbow vanished, nor could any change of place restore the vision to the boy's eyes. So he threw himself down upon the mossy bed to wait till the sunlight would give him a chance of finding the key. There he fell fast asleep. When he woke in the morning, the sun was looking straight into his eyes. He turned away from it and the same moment saw a brilliant little thing lying on the moss within a foot of his face. It was the golden key. The pipe of it was of plain gold, as bright as gold could be. The handle was curiously wrought and set with sapphires. In a terror of delight, he put out his hand and took it and had it. He lay for a while, turning it over and over and feeding his eyes upon its beauty. Then he jumped to his feet, remembering that the pretty thing was of no use to him yet. Where was the lock to which the key belonged? It must be somewhere, for how could anybody be so silly as to make a key for which there was no lock? Where should he go to look for it? He gazed about him, up into the air, down to the earth, but saw no keyholes in the clouds, the grass, or the trees. Just as he began to grow disconsolate, however, he saw something glimmering in the wood. It was a mere glimmer that he saw, but he took it for a glimmer of rainbow and went toward it. And now I will go back to the borders of the forest. Not far from the house where the boy had lived, there was another house, the owner of which was a merchant who was much away from home. He had lost his wife some years before and had only one child, a little girl, whom he left in the charge of two servants who were very idle and careless. So she was neglected and left untidy and was sometimes ill-used beside. Now it is well known that the little creatures commonly called fairies, though there are many different kinds of fairies in fairyland, have an exceeding dislike of untidiness. Indeed, they are quite spiteful to slovenly people. Being used to all the lovely ways of the trees and flowers, and to the neatness of the birds and all the woodland creatures, it makes them feel miserable, even in their deep woods and on their grassy carpets, to think that within the same moonlight lies a dirty, uncomfortable, slovenly house. And this makes them angry with the people that live in it, and they would gl gladly drive them out of the world if they could. They want the whole earth nice and clean. 
So they pinch the maids black and blue and play all manner of uncomfortable tricks. But this house was quite a shame and the fairies in the forest could not endure it. They tried everything on the maids without effect and at last resolved upon making a clean riddance, beginning with the child. They ought to have known that it was not her fault, but they have little principle and must mi much mischief in them, and they thought that if they got rid of her, the maids would be sure to be turned away. So, one evening, the poor little girl having been put to bed early, before the sun was down, the servants went off to the village, locking the door behind them. The child did not know she was alone, and lay contentedly looking out of her window toward the forest, of which, however, she could not see much, because of the ivy and other creeping plants which had straggled across her window. All at once she saw an ape making faces at her out of the mirror, and the heads carved upon the great old wardrobe grinning fearfully. Then two old spider-legged chairs came forward into the middle of the room and began a queer old-fashioned dance. This set her laughing, and she forgot the ape and the grinning heads. So the fairies saw they had made a mistake and sent the chairs back to their places. But they knew that she had been reading the story of Silver Hair all day. So the next moment she heard the voices of the three bears upon the stair, big voice, middle voice, and little voice and she heard their soft, heavy tread, as if they had had stockings over their boots, coming nearer and nearer to the door of her room, till she could bear it no longer. She did just as Silverhair did, and as the fairies wanted her to do. She darted to the window, pulled it open, got upon the ivy, and so scrambled to the ground. She then fled to the forest as fast as she could run. And we will find out what becomes of her next, next time. Thank you.